We deployed the first smart contract to Ethereum back in the day. It was a prediction market on our then competitor Augur's um, token sale, whether it would sell out or not. We were so early that we started building lots of foundational infrastructure for the wider Ethereum ecosystem. So we've built things like um, the Gnosis Safe, CowSwap, Zodiac DAO tooling, Gnosis Chain, all products and projects built within Gnosis should accrue value to the Gnosis token when you have an open platform. Anyone can kind of make the user experience better. In 10 years, all the infrastructure will be blockchain based. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Quichua, and today we have a bit of a treat because one of the hosts is becoming a guest. That's right, we have Frederica Ernst, who is co-founder at Gnosis, and she's in the in the guest seat today because we're going to be talking about Gnosis and specifically Gnosis 3.0 and their updated vision and thesis for the platform. Before we do that, though, here's a few words from our sponsors. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a visionary collective committed to fostering and expanding applications for a decentralized future. Gnosis is at the forefront of innovation with Gnosis Pay, Circles, and Metri, revolutionizing open banking and creating a superior form of money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they are building a more resilient and privacy-focused open internet. Are you seeking a robust L1 to launch your project? Well, look no further than Gnosis Chain. Enjoy the same development environment as Ethereum, but with significantly lower transaction fees. And with a robust network of over 200,000 validators, Gnosis Chain stands as a credibly neutral and resilient foundation for your application. Governance at Gnosis is driven by Gnosis DAO, where everyone has a voice in shaping the project's future. Join the Gnosis community today by participating in the Gnosis DAO governance forum. You can deploy your project on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis Chain, or help secure the network by running a validator with just a single GNO and low-cost hardware. Embark on your journey towards decentralization today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Kareka, how does it feel to be a, a, a guest on Epicenter for the first time? I am weirdly nervous about this. I mean, I've, I've been on probably like 200 Epicenter episodes, um, and this is the first time as a guest. It feels weird. It's nice. It's nice, though. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think Brian was a guest once, like way, way back in the day. He, uh, I, I had, I had yeah. interviewed him about his whole uh, Bitcoin kamikaze uh, uh, attack uh, thesis. Uh, Sonny's been on for sure, um, but I don't, I don't think Meher's been a guest. Anyway, but yeah, <laughs> uh, happy to do this, and um, really cool to. You know, see Gnosis continue to grow as an ecosystem, like very organically, but um, always like up and to the right. So um, um, let's let's get started. So like for folks who are coming at this with a fresh set of eyes, uh, what is Gnosis and what's the background here? I think like most people, of course, are familiar with Gnosis as like a longtime builder in the space, one of the very first companies to be uh, to build on Ethereum. And has gone through several sort of iterations of products and visions, but yeah, what's the Gnosis vision today, and how did you guys get here? So we've been around for um, in blockchain terms a very long time. We were we deployed the first smart contract to Ethereum back in the day. It was a prediction market on our then competitor Augur's um, token sale, whether it would sell out or not. Um, yeah, so basically we've been around for a super long time. We started as a prediction market platform. Um, we were so early 
that we started building lots of foundational infrastructure for the wider Ethereum ecosystem. So we've built things like um, the Gnosis Safe, CowSwap, Zodiac DAO tooling, Gnosis Chain, obviously, um, and a couple of other infrastructure projects that are still um, around uh, and alive today. Um, many, of course, are not, but I think this is this is uh, the natural course of building stuff. And uh, we have recently pivoted a little bit um, to what we call Gnosis 3.0, basically from building foundational infrastructure for the for the wider Ethereum ecosystem um, to building adapts that are meant to be usable eventually by actual real human people who want to use it because it works better than what they currently have. Mass adoption. We're going to get there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've been saying this every bull market, um, t not me personally, but kind of the space has been saying this every bull market since 2015, probably. <laughs> I feel like this time it's true, though, because we have built so much technology that actually um, allows us to abstract things away from the user. So, for instance, one example is the seed phrase, right? The seed phrase, it's a terrible user experience. It's these are your 24 wor words. Don't ever lose them, but also never show them to anyone or or everything else gone. I mean, this doesn't work. This doesn't work for us. It, do it doesn't work for the wider uh, public. Um, so, but having that um, that self-custodial element and that permissionlessness that kind of comes with it, um, but having a much, much better user experience, this is something that kind of we can create now. And... Uh, consequentially, I think that this is actually the bull market in which we will see consumer adoption. One of the things I I like about Gnosis and I, I find like quite commendable is that it, it appears as though like the organization is very value driven um, and staying very true to like, the original ethos of crypto of like. Um, have custody of your assets, uh, running your own nodes, um, and up, you know, getting to financial sovereignty. And I, I think that in a lot of in a, in a lot of cases, you know, teams that sort of start with that original vision or uh, or, or start with those original values that over time maybe get corrupted uh, in order to achieve better efficiency, in order to build better products. How have you guys been able to maintain um, like such a high uh, high level of focus on like the the vision and the 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 values of crypto while at the same time building tech that enables users to uh, you know to abstract away as you said like all this kind of complex technology? I think I would disagree with the premise of the question a little bit. I think in the past, we've not done this successfully. So in the past, I think we've built very much for people in the space who already knew how it worked um, and who were already um, accustomed to the uh, user experience um, drawbacks of crypto. So I think um, things like um, the Gnosis Safe, for instance, under the hood, it's, it's fantastic tech. Um, it's very much not a retail, um, it's not a retail product. Um, same for, for CowSwap, actually for most DEXs. Um, it's, they're not retail products as such. Um, so kind of so far, we've kind of optimized for building things that kind of stay true to the ethos and thereby sometimes neglecting user experience in terms of I mean, maybe it's not even fair to call it neglecting. So kind of we've prioritized building truly decentralized tech over usability. Um, and I think that's kind of been, that's kind of come to our de detriment um, many times over the years where kind of we saw um, competitors kind of pull ahead um, because kind of they were, they, they were um, taking shortcuts. And I mean, it's completely fine. But I think now we're actually in a place where we can build everything on a uh, completely uh, decentralized stack, and I think kind of it's it's kind of it's it's time to kind of think about why we actually wanted to do this in the first place, right? So if you think about why would you build anything on a completely decentralized stack, um, 
from an engineering standpoint, it's a complete pain. <laughs> so building anything, building everything on kind of AWS uh, would be much, much easier and faster. So um, kind of thinking back to what exactly the, the decentralization value proposition was, um, I think kind of it comes um, in uh, three, uh, it comes as, as a triptych, right? So basically the first thing is actually um, decentralized ownership. So kind of if you do anything on the internet today, kind of it accrues value to the same five companies and people behind the companies. Um, and with uh, with uh, decentralized technologies, we can kind of decentralize ownership um, in in uh, in that sense. The second thing is individualized agency. So kind of on on the um, uh, on Web three, we can lower um, the barrier to entry for people very significantly so they can have access to things they previously didn't have. And this uh, this also um, includes kind of coordination in very large scales in DAOs and so on. And the third thing is actually user experience, ironically, um, because kind of when you have an open platform, anyone can kind of make the user experience better. So if I kind of have a killer feature idea for a centralized product like Google Maps, there's no way I can kind of integrate it. But kind of in the uh, at that point where you kind of have a decentralized Google Maps, um, I could, for instance, say um, I know exactly how. Um, I'll give you I'll give a, give you a fictitious example here. I know exactly how um, uh, traffic light uh, the traffic lights are set in Berlin. So I can give you better um, estimates of how long it'll it'll take. Um, to get places based on kind of w which tr which f f which phase they're in and so on, um, and I could kind of just add that onto the existing decentralized Google Maps product, and you you can't do that kind of if you're building on centralized technology. So kind of um, when when we think about kind of what can we actually build now that has additional value to retail users, I think these are kind of the three prongs that kind of we, we need to look at. So ca can we make things, can we, can we benefit users from making um, ownership more decentralized? Can we um, uh, make things accessible to users that previously weren't accessible to them? Um, and can we kind of uh, build a platform on which anyone can innovate? Okay, so where does the Gnosis 3.0 vision sit into all of this? And you know, what, what is the Gnosis 3.0 vision and how did you arrive to this this state of gnosis. Yeah, so basically you know the 3.0 vision is is uh, twofold. One is uh, just very organizational. So kind of I think in the past because we have built so many things, people were always confused about kind of how it relates to the gnosis token and kind of it clarifies that. So um it kind of very clearly specifies that um all uh all products and projects built within Gnosis should accrue value to the Gnosis token, either directly or indirectly. And the way that that can happen is either they use GNO as um, as its own token, or they kind of um, have a different token that then is value coupled against the Gnosis token. So, for instance, Safe, um, they have their own token, um, and uh, it it gets put into um, an automated market maker against GNO. So, kind of if Safe appreciates GNO, will appreciate and vice versa. So kind of um, without using the same token um, and kind of while having in kind of um, independence kind of um, act the way that's in the interest of each project individually, you can still economically couple them together. Um, and we do that both with, with projects that um, we have spun out and with um, projects we have invested in. So Gnosis has, has actually, we have invested in over 80 projects um, over the last uh, six years or so, so kind of like a mini VC. Um, and we hold um, very significant positions in uh, many other tokens consequently, and kind of we can cover them the same way. So for instance, one example, um, for instance, would be Autonalus. So we hold $50 million worth in Autonalus tokens. So kind of we couple it to the GNO token this way. Does Gnosis... Uh, provide what in Cosmos we call like protocol-owned liquidity, where um, Gnosis, the chain, can provide liquidity, say, in like no token to a protocol in exchange for that protocol's token. And like this, this is used particularly in the case of the Cosmos hub, where the hub 
um, provides Atom liquidity, say, to like a DEX, and then that DEX uh, in return, it's sort of like a, a cross-chain swap, essentially, and then it, exactly. it, it aligns you know, incentives both ways. Uh, do you guys engage in that sort of... This is exactly what we do. Um, so, uh, yeah, protocol-owned liquidity is also what we call it in our books, um, and it works amazingly well for us. Um, and then obviously we have Gnosis Chain so that, you know, tokens, the staking token for Gnosis Chain, Gnosis Chain is um, very decentralized. So there's 230,000 validators, which is 20% um, of what Ethereum has. Um, and uh, you can, we, we have intentionally lowered the barrier to entry for staking so that interested lay people can kind of become a part of this network. So you need one GNO costs around $350 these days, and you can run it on um, most hardwares. You need, uh, and uh, yeah, we, we try to make it easy. For people, um, you get uh, between 10 and 15% APY. Um, it's, it's uh, lots of people do it um, just for the fun uh, of kind of be, being part of a um, decentralized network. I think it's, it's, in terms of technology, it is a similar degree of, um, technical expertise required to running um, an Ethereum node, but only a fraction of the capital requirements. So kind of the, the validator set is very large for us. How big is the Gnosis validator set now? It's like 230,000 validators. Right. There's a lot of validators. <laughs> right. But, but, but just like, if, just like an Ethereum validator, this is essentially like every validator is a chunk of, you know, like 32 no or, or something like that. Right. So it's not to a, so do you have an idea of like how many individual stakers that is? Yeah, so it's difficult to kind of pinpoint exactly and also um, that's deliberate to a certain uh, point, but it must be around 2,000 um, individuals um, who kind of, uh, uh, who, who, uh, who are validators on the network. This might sound like a kind of a silly question because I don't know this, but are, are, is there liquid staking in Gnosis? Yes. We also have liquid staking. I mean, anyone can kind of run a liquid staker on top of Gnosis, so kind of it's it's permissionless that way. Um, we don't encourage it particularly, um, just because uh, as soon as you have liquid staking, you have um, you have economies of scale again, and then uh, you end up in a kind of Lido-like situation where a significant portion of um, the staked um, asset actually rests with one set of contracts and that's um that's yeah i think this is difficult from a network perspe perspective if you kind of if if you want to make your network as resilient as possible this is not a great situation to be in but um what we also have and this was um this we actually ha a had the first instance startup this week is um oboil uh which is uh, a decentralized kind of validator Exactly. Yeah. And there's also Diva, which also decentralized validation and so on. So, and we've, we've also, those are also among the projects that, that we as Gnosis have invested into, um, just to make sure that kind of um, the ecosystem remains robust. Right. So how are you leveraging Obol? Um, Obol runs on Gnosis chain, um, just like, uh, like it does on mainnet. Okay. Got it. Okay. Interesting. So. This this pivot from building foundational infrastructure to DApps, uh, what does that mean, sort of, at, or organizationally? Does it mean that Gnosis uh, is taking a step back in terms of maintaining the the, the foundational infrastructure, and uh, will have more uh, sort of product people building DApps internally, or are you in investing or financing DApp developers to build on the infrastructure? Well, so yeah, how, how does that kind of yeah, that's that's the other part of the Gnosis 3.0 vision. Um, so that's kind of um, the idea that now we kind of have to build um, applications that kind of serve real people with real problems. Um, we will not stop um, maintaining the infrastructure for sure. So kind of like part of the infrastructure projects are spun out. So um, Safe and Cow and Zodiac and so on, their 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 own things, just as Kapatki is, which we retain. Uh, you know, a, a large stake in, uh, but they are their own projects, and they kind of we we have no hand in kind of running them operationally in any way. Um, so 
and Gnosis Chain, yes, we will absolutely continue maintaining it. Um, it is more of a coordinative role, um, kind of just like you wouldn't say the Ethereum Foundation kind of runs Ethereum. Um, kind of we have a core dev coordinator um, and uh, we have all the different clients that or most of the different clients that um, Ethereum mainnet also has. So they have dedicated Gnosis chain teams and kind of we have someone in-house who coordinates those teams. But in principle, um, that is pretty coordinate uh, that, that is pretty decentralized and we don't have to do a lot of thing things. There are other things where kind of we do have a hand in kind of making sure that um, foundational infrastructure is there for the Gnosis ecosystem. So things like making sure there are block explorers, making sure um, the RPC endpoints work and so on. Um, usually that that just um, that is run via the Gnosis DAO, so kind of the RPC endpoint providers and uh, and uh, uh, the block explorer providers and so on. They just um, make a proposal to the Gnosis DAO. Obviously, we review this, but so do all others, other GNO holders. So kind of this is kind of, um, it is, <laughs> we we still feel responsible for it to a certain degree, but it actually runs pretty well on its own. And this idea that kind of we will pivot to, um, to uh, applications and specifically uh, payments and financial rails applications. This is the other uh, the other half of the Gnosis 3.0 vision. Yeah, I want to talk about the the, the payments and financial rails in, in a second because I think that's actually one of the most interesting things here. <laughs> so how did we get there? So we we just literally sat down with a blank sheet of paper and kind of um, brainstormed where we think we can add the most value with the technology stack that we currently sit on. Um, and th th there were a couple of contenders. Another one was social media, because obviously, clearly it would um, benefit a lot from kind of being on a credibly neutral platform. Um, but the easiest lift in terms of technology um, seemed payments, um, uh, while at the same time, the business model that kind of payments comes with it's very clear. So kind of this this is tried and tested a million times. So um, we kind of eliminated as many unknowns as possible and said, okay, this is where we can provide something that is actually useful to a very significant number of people. And we think we can build it with what we currently have. That that that's uh, That was basically the rationale behind it. Yeah. So I'd like to talk about Gnosis DAO a little bit and um, its role in governing the Gnosis infrastructure. Um, what what aspects of the infrastructure does it govern? Is it is it just Gnosis Chain or does it have uh, also a role to play in other of the foundational infrastructure like the SAFE or like what are the interactions, I guess, between Gnosis DAO and the SAFE DAO and, you know, some of the other infrastructure that you have? Uh, that's a fantastic question. So um, first of all, it doesn't really govern Gnosis Chain. So there's very few parameters that the DAO actually sets. In principle, kind of Gnosis Chain is, is governed by the validator set um, because they kind of, they decide on whether to upgrade their nodes to which software. Um, if, if, you, if the validators are not on board, there'll be a hard fork and so on. Um, so... Uh, and then there's there's actually a lot of other stakeholders that also kind of influence Gnosis chain, often not as um, directly as the validator set. So things like the core developers, um, the the stablecoin providers, um, the RPC endpoint providers, the Oracle providers, centralized exchanges, and so on. All basically that entire set of actors, they somehow govern. Um, Gnosis chain together, just like the same is true for Ethereum, right? We wouldn't say Ethereum, the Ethereum Foundation governs Ethereum, and it's the same for Gnosis. What um, the Gnosis DAO actually mainly does is allocate treasury. So the Gnosis DAO sits on a very large treasury, around 500 million um, in uh, GNO and another 500 million in um, Ether and stable coins and um, other uh, other tokens. Um, and the the Gnosis token kind of um, is a voting token in the DAO, so um, the allocation of funds happens via the DAO. This is kind of the main um, the main uh, 
thing that the DAO does. And then kind of it tries to align um, all of these um, portfolio tokens, <laughs> portfolio companies with Gnosis's interests. So for instance, um, Gnosis DAO holds 20% um, of the safe token supply. Um, so obviously kind of there are talks between Gnosis DAO and safe DAO about kind of like how to align each um, each other strategically. Um, and then uh, kind of just because kind of <laughs> there's very large aligned economic interest between the two DAOs. Um, and uh, yeah, in principle, that should be um, much more out in the open. So I think a lot of this actually happens um, like for all DAOs at the moment, kind of behind closed doors and different telegram groups and then kind of proposals get posted and kind of there's protocol politicians and so on. Um, I think coming to a point where a lot of that is transparent and um, open to anyone who kind of wants to join that discussion, um, I think this is somewhere we need to get to. Um, one initiative that we're spearheading is kind of having... Um, having um, a dedicated forum page um, for each large holding um, in tokens that Gnosis DAO has, where kind of people can talk about the strategic alignment, say, between Gnosis and SAFE and what SAFE should do for us and what we should do for SAFE um, and uh, kind of what what happens if the, uh, this doesn't happen. Because always kind of when you hold tokens, obviously divestment is always an option, right? So um, yeah, basically having having these alliances out in the open um, th that are currently, and I mean, I'm not even a part of most of these alliances. They kind of, they happen between different, you know, uh, token holders and safe token holders, and uh, they kind of result in proposals in the forums. But yeah, so in principle, this is how, um, this is how Gnosis and the portfolio companies or projects kind of align themselves. What's the philosophy in terms of capital, uh, allocation management like uh, is the gnosis philosophy to have all of the capital uh the treasury managed by the dow or you know do, do you guys have uh like sort of organizations that uh are allocated pools of capital with like a, a board that that itself allocates capital so like for instance in cosmos like the hub allocated quite a bit of capital to this organization called aa dow they have a team that reviews grant grant proposals and you know issues those proposals so it's you know it's sort of outsourcing that work because what what it i mean i think what we found here in, at least in cosmos governance was that the hub was not really like the token holders were not always the uh better the best equipped uh to make decisions about what to allocate capital to and and so this is why like part of uh the cosmos treasury was uh, allocated to AA, AA DAO. Does something like this exist in Gnosis? Yes. So historically, this has grown. So kind of um, back in the day, a company actually conducted the token sale and that company still holds a small part of the treasury. And kind of from that company, we do actually uh, do product in product development mostly. Um, anyone else could in principle um, ask for a grant from Gnosis DAO to do the same. Um, but, um, so far this has happened once. So kind of, we had once a proposal was a very large proposal, um, of a group of people who credibly, um, claimed to what to do, um, business development in the ecosystem building on our behalf because, uh, uh, business development and marketing and so on, they, they were never our strong suits. And they said, look, you allocate us this capital. We, we, we can do it for you. And in the end, kind of the the funds were returned were returned because it didn't go so well. But in principle, Gnosis DAO is very much open to that. Um, so kind of having having different contributors in charge of different things. And one one relationship where that's actually worked incredibly well for Gnosis in the past is the relationship with Kapatki, which is also a DAO that has spun out of Gnosis. Um, it's a treasury management DAO. Um, so they manage our treasury, but also the safe and cow treasuries, as well as uh, Lido and Ava and Balancer um, and uh, a number of ENS and a number of other DAOs. Um, and for us, this has worked super well because um, we don't want our capital to lie fallow. But obviously, <laughs> this is not something that um, that a DAO can 
vote on kind of on you know on a in a cadence that makes sense. You can't say we want to vote on whether to withdraw funds from this pool and so on. So this is also. Um, what um, drove the development of the Zodiac DAO tooling, so um, so that kind of we can we, we as NOSTA could hand this over to Kapatki without them having custody of the funds, so they can now do things to they can do certain operations to the funds um, that they are being uh, that that they are managing, but they for instance they can't withdraw them and or sell them and so on. They kind of they have a per, they have a permissioned list. Of um, uh, of things they can do to the funds, um, kind of like like a fund manager. Mm, okay, no, interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess it works for as long as it works, right? If the DAO uh, and the token holders are effective in allocating that capital, and the community at at large is satisfied with how capital is is managed and uh, and allocated, then then it makes sense to sort of continue in. In, in this configuration. Um, yeah, no, but I, yeah. I'm 100% with you. So kind of DAOs and Gnosis DAO included need to become much, much more efficient. So I think kind of the one thing that kind of we need to understand is that the uh, the very constrained um, thing in DAOs is attention and kind of paying for the attention of, um, the, of the participants um, and kind of only escalating certain decisions, kind of delegating some decisions to others. I think this is this is infrastructure that kind of we as an ecosystem very much still have to build up because um, kind of saying, for instance, um, I uh, I trust um, X Y's um, judgment in terms of treasury allocation, but I don't want them in charge of say the marketing. Um, the marketing tactics and so on. I want someone else in charge of that and kind of saying, uh, t telling people, basically having a way of kind of delegating your vote depending on what topic um, you're voting. I think this is, uh, th this will be a great boon for the ecosystem. Yeah. What, one of the things that we've seen sort of exper experimented with in, in the Cosmos ecosystem is the, is the use of sub DAOs. So Cosmos DAO infrastructure, at least like the DAO DAO infrastructure that's used um, primarily, allows for for sub DAOs, and so some e some ecosystems or some some chains have uh, created sub DAOs, right? So you have like the treasury, and then the treasury will allocate uh, uh, some capital to another DAO, and then that DAO would have members that manage like a smaller pool of members that manage that capital, say for like marketing or business development or uh, project funding. And the, the 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 parent DAO you know has some amount of uh, also um, power over uh, revoking you know some of those members if they, if the community feels that like members are not acting in, in a way that's desirable like they can revoke access uh, they can veto certain types of proposals so it creates like I think a really kind of streamlined uh, architecture for DAOs to reallocate pools of capital to, to other DAOs instead of like sending that money to just some organization off chain, right. That, uh, has a pool of like members that, um, that aren't accountable, directly accountable on chain to the, to the parent DAO. Yeah. I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think this is also by and large how traditional companies are structured, right. Kind of like you have a marketing department that has a certain budget and if they go totally off the rails, you kind of, you have, you have heads rolling. And then kind of you, and I think this is exactly how kind of it needs to work in DAOs down the line as well. But obviously kind of putting all of these things that, um, all of these mechanisms on chain is always a bit of a challenge. Yeah. So let's talk about the payments focus here. Uh, so, so Gnosis Pay is, I think, one of the, the main products that um, uh, you launched in, in last year uh, that, uh, it's, it's actually like quite interesting. We talked about this on on when you were on the Interop podcast a couple of months ago, and all of the cool tech behind Gnosis Pay that allows people to uh, have money, like basically like on an on chain address and and the credit card signing the transaction, and it's it's actually like quite quite cool. I think technically, uh, but there's other there's two other products here that I'm not very familiar with, which is Circles. I know that's uh, your um, uh, universal universal basic income protocol, and then Metri that I'm not very familiar with. So 
yeah, wh wh what what's the what's the overlying thesis here? Like, why did you you know when you sat down and like thought about what this infrastructure could be used for? Uh, why did payments um, stand out as the, the 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 vertical where you could provide the most value? That's a fantastic question. Um, so, if you kind of look at payments in our bubble, kind of like, and I don't mean the Web three bubble, but kind of like uh, the global North bubble, payments are not a lot of are, are not a big pain point for us. So, kind of, you can send funds. Um, to your friends, you know, in, in a couple of minutes at more or less zero cost. You you can get, you have access to loans, you have credit cards, kind of everything kind of works for you. Um, this can't be said for a lot of the rest of the world. So, um, I mean, even for us, there are some edge cases where we kind of feel the limitations of the financial system. So recently, for instance, I had to send um, a, re a fairly significant um, amount of uh, money to the United States for an investment. Um, and uh, it cost me, I think, 100 euros with wise um, to kind of send it. And I mean, obviously, had I, had I just sent USDC, it would have cost me almost nothing. Um, but uh, I mean, those are edge cases. By and large, kind of payments work well for us. Um, if you look at, for instance, um, Latin America, or even countries like Turkey um, in Europe, um, we see that inflation runs rampant. And even access to a dollarized account is a status symbol. To us, that's not even a product anymore, right? Being able to hold USDC on-chain, we don't think of that as a product. But really, it is. For a large part of the global population, this very much is a product. So for our rationale was, if we can kind of build... Um, something like a way for people to access this technology, even without building any more financial protocols ourselves, just providing them with access will actually unlock a lot of economic value for them. Um, so the idea behind Metri, which is the project you're unfamiliar with, but not really because it used to be called Gnosis Wallet. It just got a proper name. Um, so Metri is based on the safe. Um, it's kind of an, it's a nice um, uh, mobile interface uh, built on a safe backend. Um, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to onboard your friends really easily. Kind of they, they can kind of set up a new account with um, the push of a fun fingerprint. Um, they can secure it later, kind of when they have um, significant funds in it, they can always add more signers. Um, but they can, it gives them the opportunity to kind of hold stable coins they otherwise wouldn't be able to hold, kind of wouldn't be able to hold that currency. And that, that is, is a very simple um, use case for us, but something that is of a very real value to actual people. Um, and then the way that we think about it is kind of, okay, now you kind of have to um, connect it with um, the um, the legacy financial rails that we already have, that people already use. So you want things like you want an IBAN integration. So kind of you want um, your wallet to be addressable by an IBAN. So you send funds to that IBAN, they show up in your wallet. You can do a separate transfer right out of your wallet. That's all tech that exists. It's all tech that kind of we can, we just have to put together in one place. Gnosis Pay as well. So kind of Gnosis Pay is kind of built on the same premise. So Gnosis Pay allows you to connect a self-custodial wallet, such as the safe under the hood of the Metri wallet, to um, a credit card, um, allowing you to kind of off-ramp your crypto anywhere that Visa is accepted. And kind of building those bridges <laughs> between the old and the new is how we think we can um, make adoption happen. Um, and kind of an example that kind of I like to use is the telecom revolution, right? Kind of when we were kids, um, we had we had we had uh, landline phones, and then kind of when we were like teenagers, Skype ca came along, and kind of you had Skype uh, Skype out. You could kind of call any landline um, phone um, for the local tariff, and the way that that worked. And this is for the younger listeners. So basically. Phoning other countries used to be really, really expensive. So when I was a kid, I had an aunt in America. Calling her 
was like the entire family kind of collecting around the, the telephone, kind of uh, saying, oh, hi, hi, Auntie Margaret, how's everything going and so on. And then kind of we hang up like uh, three minutes later and it was 10, 10 German marks at the time or something. Um, and uh, kind of having that um, step up to Skype out, um, where kind of you pay the local tariff regardless of where you phoned, um, that was a, that was fantastic in terms of user experience. The way they did it is they kind of they used new rails for the first ninety five percent of the call, namely it was routed over the internet, and then the last five percent were over the old copper cable. Um, and then kind of as uh, as this voice over IP protocol kind of gained traction. Um, and other people had Skype too, you could just do everything over the internet and kind of became completely free. Um, and now even when you kind of phone landline phone to landline phone, um, it it, you, it it will still be routed over the internet. It'll be still be voice over IP. Don't actually do this on copper cables anymore. And I think it'll be the same for um, financial rails. So uh, in 10 years, all the infrastructure will be blockchain based. It's just that we kind of have to um, I have to take out bits and replace them by the equivalent uh, blockchain infrastructure that is hardier and simpler um, and by and la without people noticing in the process. So I think the user experience will stay largely the same as it did with kind of calling someone on the phone. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Uh, I, I really like that. And uh, I'm reminded of just how much regulatory pushback there was also on Skype and, and all these voice over IP uh, providers, uh, because they were, I think, I think telecom companies, uh, saw that they were going to either have to adapt or, you know, lose a large part of their, um, revenues, um, for, for voice calling, which, you know, they have, they've made up with really expensive, uh, internet plans and, and, and this sort of thing. But, um, yeah, I, 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 I think that one of the, one, so one of the use cases I, I absolutely love about, this whole like Gnosis Pay infrastructure is the IBAN to blockchain. Uh, so I, I use Monarium fairly regularly for you know personal use, but also for my, my company. And that being able to send money on, to send money to an IBAN and it appears on chain, and vice versa, send money from a chain uh, to a bank account, and it, it's instant. It happens in seconds. I mean, it uses the the instant SEPA. Uh, infrastructure rails, which allows you to get separate transfers in, in you know, less than ten, 10 seconds. It's it's magic. <laughs> it's, it just it feels great to be able to uh, move in and out um, of of a chain without having to go through like you know your Kraken account or some other exchange that on on ramp off ramp. It's so seamless, and you know there's so many improvements that that could be made there. I think just from that particular use case, uh, namely. You know, with Monarium, uh, the ability just to, uh, to to swap directly into that Euro coin, etc. I mean, I, I think maybe they've added that by now, but but Gnosis Pay is kind of similar. Where uh, and and I don't even have a Gnosis Pay card yet. I'm just talking oh, from what no. others have told me. I need to get one. I need to apply for it. But uh, but yeah, with Gnosis Pay, you, you have you have funds on on chain, and if you've used one of these you know, crypto to credit card services before, typically what you have to do is you have to onboard, you, you have to, you have to, um, uh, top up your card, right? So you have to send money to an address, then it shows up on the card and, and then you can make your payments. But, but here the, the card is actually signing a transaction on chain on your account. And so you don't need to do this, this kind of top up, um, thing that introduces some interesting privacy issues that I'd love to get your opinion on as someone who I know is like very, um, particular and it's sort of careful about you know, your on-chain privacy. What, w like, what are the risks that people uh, get into here when using this card where essentially every, not, now not just on-chain transactions, but also their, their real world transactions. Like every time they buy a baguette, you know, um, which is for me every day. Uh, yeah, that shows up on chain. What's the, how, I mean, what's the risk here and, and how do we resolve this this issue? Yeah, this is the main issue at the moment. So kind of, we decided to kind of launch this knowing that the privacy was non-existent um, just because there were other, other heavy lifts kind of engineering 
uh, of, of you know, in, in the engineering of this, that kind of we just needed to get out of the door and kind of we couldn't work on this forever. So, um, yeah, privacy shit. Um, so, I mean, cur currently, um, when you go to your local baker um, and you pay two, two euros 90 for a baguette, um, two euro 90, um, the two euro 90 uh, payment I don't know up. where you're buying baguettes, but... Uh... <laughs> How much is a baguette in Paris these days? The, the baguettes in Paris are like a buck 25. Okay. This is, I need to go back to Paris sometime. Uh, that sounds wonderful. Yeah, so you you pay you pay one euro twenty five for your baguette, um, and uh, d uh, that payment shows up on chain. You you can't see that it goes to the baker because it actually goes to the Monarium off ramp account. Um, so odd payments kind of go to the same address, and then the 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 settlement of them is actually batched. Um, we try to obfuscate a bit by kind of rolling different tran transactions together, but it's not very good obfuscation. Um, so you are 100% right that kind of the privacy aspect of this currently is the Achilles heel. Why do I still use it? Because basically I think it's important that kind of we iron out um, as much of the user experience aspects um, as we can when we can. Um, we're, we're working on the privacy aspect. So there will be a privacy respecting uh, version. Um, I don't want to say soonish because that will jinx it. Um, also, privacy on chain is pretty hard. Um, but yeah, we're working on it. I know it's a problem, and we we will address it. Yeah, the other aspect here is the regulatory, uh, the regulatory issue, which is that I mean. Well, I, I know that 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 policymakers, at least here in France and and some at the EU level, are pushing for all crypto transactions, uh, whether they're happening on an exchange or some kind of payment service provider, for that data to be automatically sent to local uh, tax, um, uh, like the local tax authorities. I think this is. You know, I, I, obviously a massive infringement on people's rights to privacy, uh, where, you know, we're not talking here about a government being able to sort of subpoena uh, or request uh, one's transactions information because there is a suspicion of a crime or evading taxes, or, or et cetera. We're talking here about wholesale, all transactions uh, being available to the state uh, at, any t at any point in time. What types of technological improvements can can be made to products like Gnosis Pay to curb, uh, at least to some extent, uh, this infringement? That I, I, it's just not in place, right? But I, I know that there are policymakers that are uh, that are um, proponents of this sort of blanket um, blanket, uh, you know, Gestapo style uh, data collection. Yeah, so I mean, this is also why many lawmakers push for CBDCs, uh, because basically everything is transparent and on-chain. Um, I think um, we need to push back here on a cultural level and say privacy is no more privacy. Basically, um, I, uh, I morally object um, to having this sort of transparency for the state. I think how it can be mitigated um, and how it should be mitigated, because I also I also see the legitimate interest of states to collect taxes. So I don't think all taxation is theft and so on. I think um, by and large states um, deserve to collect taxes and pay for public goods that way. Obviously, the way that they collect them is um, it should be um, improved in a technological way. So, for instance, we could have something like um, zero knowledge proof um, attached um, to transactions, um, saying, okay, this transaction of a private matter, for instance, I am gifting my sister 10,000 euro um, so she can kind of put a down payment on a house sort of thing that is not taxed. It shouldn't be taxable. I kind of attach a proof that this is nothing to be taxed. Um, the state shouldn't have to know 
whom I'm sending it to or why I'm sending it and so on. Just It should just know that in principle, this is not a taxable event. Um, same for other things. If I sell something to someone, obviously this is a taxable event and this could also be kind of conveyed with a zero knowledge proof. Um, so I think um, keeping people honest and kind of enforcing honesty while at the same time um, protecting privacy, this is kind of the Goldilocks zone for me. Um, and I think we can get there. The one thing that really worries me is how much privacy um, has already been undercut um, by um, and regulatorily captured. Um, and I worry that um, while regulators usually say this is to protect and uh, to make sure that taxes are paid and so on, um, I worry that this is not the only motive. And of course that not. they will be, yeah. And that you don't they have to worry be, about it. It's it's actually not the only motive. Yeah, that yeah. they will be resistant to kind of changing this to a way that is demonstrably um, fair and affected, uh, effective at enforcing taxes while at the same time still being privacy preserving. And I think this is a pa battle we will have to fight um, generally as 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 a people, um, and uh, we're we're here to fight it. Right. I, I think like the good faith argument that uh, that ZK is the technology that enables states to have oversight over the types of transactions. I mean, not, not just in this case. I mean, there's all sorts of use cases where ZK could allow people to have privacy while ensuring some form of attestation about it could be whatever. It could be a transaction. It could be someone's uh, where someone's living. It could be someone's income. Like there's just like all sorts of really interesting use cases that allow us to have sort of like this best of both worlds type of scenario. The the fact that I, I think that th these technologies will never be adopted in full deployment because they don't allow states, uh, nation states, and you know sort of EU. Uh, governance machine to have full visibility into people's dealings. Like I, I think that fundamentally this is out opposition with the modus operandi of the European governance system um, that you know increasingly wants to have more and more data and information. Uh, and access to that data information on its citizens. And um, I know that's not only in Europe, I know like in other places, like in the States, you know, like although the States I think have uh, much better constitutional protections, but but many, most European countries I think don't have those con the same constitutional protections that, and and puts us at risk of, of being, of becoming yeah, sort of part of this police I'm state. I mean, you can use these technologies for terrible things, right? I mean, kind of you can you can do an incredibly effective kind of social sto school, kind of like China has, using these un uh, the, these immutable ledgers. I think it, it's it's a battle we will have to fight, and I think kind of um, imbuing people with the certainty that privacy is normal, privacy should be the norm. This is something that is. Um, this is something that we have to do. Absolutely. I want to talk a little bit about the EVM here. Um, and, you know, Gnosis, of course, like we've talked about before, is one of the the the, the uh, most OG teams building on the EVM. And the EVM has really dominated uh, the the developer ecosystem for blockchains. You know, Solidity is by by a large margin the most used smart contract language to build on blockchains across the not only Ethereum but the entire EVM ecosystem. Uh, but Solidity and and the EVM are next year going to be ten years old. And you know, if we're thinking now that you know we're arriving at a place where we can now start to have applications built on blockchains. And that essentially we're sort of in the, you know, I sort of I sort of see us as somewhere like I see I see this moment akin to the kind of like when when the iPhone came out. You know, we had the internet before that, but things really took off when we had mobile. 
And that's also when we saw a shift from PHP and the LAMP stack to a very modular and modern development stack in the form of mostly like Node and um, and modularizing the, um, uh, the 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 um, the development stack. So like AWS, for instance, um, and the the cloud stack have very modular components that allow developers to kind of pick and choose and scale um, their applications. So from the perspective of the EVM, you know, I, I kind of see the EVM and, and Solidity a little bit like PHP where they're very important and, and crucial to crypto as like a foundational piece of software infrastructure for crypto, but I think are going sort of in the way of becoming legacy software. So in 10 years from now, when the EVM is 20 years old, you know, do we think that most college kids will be learning to learn, learning to code solidity or some other language that is modern, built for the modular infrastructure, interoperable, uh, doesn't have the performance and security issues of the EVM, performant, et cetera. And so that, that's kind of like my perspective on the EVM and, and solidity. Uh, I think probably you don't share that, that perspective uh, exactly, uh, but, you know, Looking long term, like ten years from now, you know, Gnosis will most likely still be an EVM chain, but there's going to be lots of other chains out there that are leveraging modern, performance, safe, secure uh, programming languages. Um, how do you see that playing out long term, and in terms of like the EVMs and Solidity's market share? And do you think that it can continue to, to compete and remain relevant uh, in this uh, fast-paced, you know, sort of like evolving? Uh, infrastructure space in crypto. Yeah, so I think I think the EVM. I think we're not so far far apart in kind of what we believe here. So I think the EVM will re remain re relevant, kind of as um, the underlying. I think um, people in ten years will not learn to program Solidity, but I also believe people in ten years will not learn to program any other programming language because um, large language models and uh, uh, other transformer like um, software systems will be so good at kind of understanding what we want software to do that they will build this for us. So I think this will be abstracted away from us in a um, much larger manner than most people currently believe. And yes, I think kind of what what things kind of compile to down below, the people won't know about and won't care. Just like they don't know um, how uh, how kind of your uh, your Python script today is transformed into bytecode that can actually be executed by uh, by silicon circuits, right? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with that. More development work will be done by AI agents, uh, like transformer types. Um, but there remains, I think, some really important things to note about the EVM, uh, like performance compared to some of the other, you know, parallelized VMs in crypto that allow for just like much faster and much higher throughput. Uh, there are the security issues that remain right in in the form of like reentrancy attacks, etc. Um, and then some features that uh, exist in other frameworks that that don't exist in the EVM, like. For example, in the Move uh, VM, we have the ability to have keys that are per application. So this enables some containerization or um, of, of like security risks, uh, interoperability being embedded in um, other languages, like for example, Cosm Wasm, being able to leverage IBC, these sorts of things. Like, do do you think that the EVM in its current form and Solidity in its current form as being like a very low level blockchain language? should include uh, or or do, do you think that like th these features will get built on top of the EVM as like supplements uh, and other layers on top or do like this kind of framework approach do you think it makes sense for that to become part of the underlying uh, framework like VM framework I so um I think it goes without saying that if you were to kind of construct the EVM from scratch again today you would make some cho uh, choices differently than kind of we made them back in the day. I think this is a completely fair point to make. I think 
almost everything that you mentioned can be implemented on top of the existing EVM stack. It won't be quite as efficient as if it were implemented kind of at the lowest possible level. But I think in the in the grand scheme, that won't matter so much because the EVM has such um, a head start in terms of um, developer attention and um, kind of resources that have been created around it that competing with it won't just require being a little bit better here and there. It would actually require being 10x better. Um, and I, I don't see that happening. Uh, so even with paraly paralyzable systems, to a certain extent, we can actually do that by having different execution environments and then kind of trustlessly connecting them together, kind of like um, IBC style. So I think there are workarounds for all of these things and kind of having, um, I think where Ethereum has actually erred, um, where we can kind of learn from the Cosmos style um, blockchain um, ecosystems um, is having a native IBC type thing. Um, so kind of having native interoperability kind of built into the system. Here, I think this was the largest um, thing that kind of was um, neglected um, kind of for EVM type systems. But also for that, I think we're catching up. Um, so I think kind of at, at this point, I would still bet on the EVM. I don't think it's, it, it's I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put all my money on it. I think it's still possible that it'll be overtaken by other uh, other systems, but it won't be for small efficiency gains. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. I I, I think that hmm, I, I I do think that that this sort of story of PHP and ASP as the dominant development languages in the two thousands um, is a comparable analogy where PHP still, I think, powers something like 60 to 70% of websites on the internet because it powers this like legacy infrastructure or this like, uh, um, so I, I think like most of Facebook is built in PHP, uh, WordPress, which is like, I don't know, 50% of the websites on the internet, you know, uses PHP. So there are like a handful of really important pieces of internet software that continue to use PHP and that um, uh, make up for the majority of the deployments, uh, but but new applications you know, like new startups, etc., are mostly building like using other languages. And I I, th I think I think that this is a similar path that the EVM will take, where very important crypto infrastructure, Aave, Compound, Synthetics, uh, you know, uh, Uniswap, etc., like these very large and very important pieces of financial rails will continue to use the EVM and 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 fund the EVM's development also perhaps um, while you know newer applications l2s app chains uh, will use other languages most likely so that's kind of where I where I see things heading I wonder if, if that makes sense to you yeah absolutely and I mean that's what we see today right I mean a large number of l2s actually decided against using um, the EVM, right? So kind of, uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, maybe just one one final question here as we wrap up. Um, so currently, Gnosis Chain is a sovereign chain. I guess you could even call it a sovereign app chain because it 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 it, it is an application that allows you to run financial rails. Uh, it r runs uh, kind of like very precise and very specific types of, of, of applications. Uh, but will Gnosis become an L2 at some point? Like, is there a world in which uh, Gnosis rents its security from uh, another chain like Ethereum? That's a tough one. Um, I think as you ask a question, the answer is probably no. I also wouldn't call Gnosis an app chain because it's very much a general purpose chain and there's all kinds of applications on it. Um, but I think we will start thinking about L2s and L1s in a much more nuanced way. Um, so we even see that already with kind of Validiums where kind of um, we see 
um, L2s that um, check into um, the L1 periodically and kind of how often that is. Obviously, th this is this is a cadence that you can set. Um, but but kind of the data availability is not on Ethereum for cost reasons. It's elsewhere. Um, and uh, we, we also see these uh, uh, these sovereign roll-ups, which some people say aren't actually roll-ups roll at all, but basically kind of where um, where where kind of the you can kind of play with um, how many validators you have for that particular roll-up, kind of what the rules are, how to become a uh, to how to become a validator, how validators are slashed if they misbehave, um, how often these chains kind of check in with Ethereum, how much of their their um, data they actually post as call data or in the blobs. Um, or where else to post them. So I don't think this is kind of going to be a binary thing. You're an L2 or you're not an L2. It's kind of going to be a continuous spectrum. And I think we can actually imagine a world where Gnosis regularly checks in with Ethereum and kind of posts its state to Ethereum. You can also imagine a world where Ethereum does the same with Gnosis, right? Kind of where Ethereum regularly posts the the, the hash of the Ethereum state to Gnosis chain. That, that wouldn't automatically make Ethereum an L2 to Gnosis, right? It would kind of just m make them federated in some way. And I think um, kind of having a better terminology of kind of how um, how chains check in with each other and kind of what the trust assumptions are for transacting, for transacting between chains, I think this will have to come because at this point it's um, it's not granular enough. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, I, and I, I, I'm going to push back on the app chain thing. I, I think Gnosis <laughs> is an app chain. The app is generalized smart contracts. And but but I think it's I, I call it an app chain because it has a specific like it has a vertical that is kind of its go to market, and and that vertical is very much like foundational financial infrastructure. And so you know it's not it's not an app chain in the same way that. Like Osmosis is an app chain that has an app, right? And that app is a DEX. And then there's also other applications built on top of Osmosis. So you could also say that like Osmosis to some extent is a, a generalized, although it's not fully permissionless. Um, but yeah. I think I, I, I see where you're coming from. And I think this makes sense in kind of um, defining the vertical because um, what kind of different things in the same vertical often have in common, common is kind of how much they're willing to pay for a transaction, how much security they need, right? Kind of. So if you were to have a, st if you were to have a, a chain that primarily um, caters to games, um, the security assumptions that kind of you need as a game developer are probably very different than the security assumptions you you, you need if kind of you want to have um, uh, the land registry on chain. Right. So, and I think kind of making sure that the um, trust assumptions that come with the chain in terms of kind of how how um, how the validator set is chosen, what happens if they misbehave, um, what what are the the trust assumptions you have for bridging and so on. Um, I think this has to be in keeping with what you're trying to secure, and obviously, kind of Gnosis chain is um, is very incredibly neutral in the sense that it's decentralized and no one one validator kind of can sway the the, the thing just like on ethereum um, then it makes complete sense to kind of say okay this primarily caters to financial applications because obviously financial applications have in common that there's usually money at stake great Faleka, this has been really terrific uh it's uh, I, yeah, you, being being in the being in the guest spot not so not so uh, not so hard, right? Like uh, <laughs> I think you did pretty well. Thank you. Uh, before we wrap up, I I do want to uh, plug Nebular Summit. Um, I haven't talked about it here on Epicenter so much. I've talked about it on my other podcast, but uh, yeah, Nebular Summit is the Interchain Developer Conference that we are hosting. We Interop Ventures. Uh, it is happening in Brussels after ECC on July twelfth and thirteenth. So if you're interested in learning about the Cosmos ecosystem, the modular app chain ecosystem, and so much more, uh, it's not just a Cosmos conference. In fact, this year, you know, we're trying to go beyond Cosmos. We're getting more folks from other ecosystems, Ethereum, 
the EVM ecosystem, Solana, uh, movement, etc. cetera. Um, so come to Nebula Summit. It's a developer event. So most of the talks and content is very technical. We'll have developer workshops there. Uh, there's also an investor speed dating. So if you're interested in meeting VCs to pitch your idea and hopefully get funding, you can also do that. You can apply for that. Uh, everything is available at nebular.builder. So here you can apply for investor speed dating and also get your tickets. So once again, that's July 12th and 13th in Brussels. Really hope to see you there. I'm, I'm bummed out you won't be at ECC this year, uh, but I'm yeah, sure there's going to be like lots of year. Gnosis people there. <laughs> um, so looking forward to seeing those, those people. Great. Thanks so much, Felika. Thank you for having me on.